بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد فقال عز وجل في محكم التنزيل إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب Today I'm going to try to talk about a topic <coughs> that has to do with Quranic wisdom and one of the philosophical points that the Quran tries to make very clear and that is the relationship between aql intelligence human intelligence aql and the human fitra the human disposition now uh, I made some notes here so that people can follow along because I think this is a very important topic. So let me actually just enlarge this a little bit. So human disposition and the existence of God. Let me, uh, before I go further, mention that from a pure perspective of pure reason, as this terminology of pure reason some people may recall the book written by the father of modern philosophy, Kant. He wrote the book called um, The Critique of Pure Reason. From a purely intellectual perspective, he said, and he said correctly, and that is that from a purely, purely intellectual and logical not intellectual, but, but logical rather. From a purely logical perspective, you can't prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran is very clear on this too. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بالغيب, Those who believe in the unseen. So how can the unseen become real? If it cannot become real only on the basis of intellect itself. So this is what I want to discuss. Something that the Quran discusses that is extremely important, that is not part of our discourse as much. And so I want to bring this to the forefront for people to think about. Like for example, when the Quran says the word ayah, sign. Right? But... When it is uh, when it is looking at nature, when Allah is saying, "Look at my signs." Signs are something that point to something other than itself, right? It is not a direct proof; it is an indirect indication, and it is an indication for the one who has that perspective that is necessary to be able to see from that perspective. Otherwise, you don't see it because the thing that is a sign is only a sign for the people that have a certain perspective. I will explain this a little bit more, <clears throat> inshallah ta'ala, but let us look at certain aspects. So, ghaib is those who believe in the unseen, meaning the things that are unseen to human beings, including heaven and hell, including the uh, existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a very clear, manifest, obvious existence. Right? It's very clear. So, but purely on uh, what can be called logical reasoning, or purely on rational reasoning, uh, one can argue, uh, you know, they say an iron cuts, you need iron to cut iron. So, logic can cut logic. And this is the test. When the Prophet ﷺ was in the cave, what was he doing? All alone in the cave, yatahannath. Yani, uh, he was doing what the ulama call i'tibar, tafakkur wal i'tibar. He was reflecting. So what was the difference between the Prophet reflecting in the cave and a philosopher sitting in his couch reflecting upon the universe using his philosophy and his logic? What did the Prophet have, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that this philosopher did not did not have? Because the philosopher is also thinking about unseen things, 
trying to answer the big questions that you cannot verify. And the Prophet is sitting in the cave, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, doing i'tibar and tafakkur on the things that are also unseen. And the Prophet is knocking on the divine doors and this philosopher sitting on his chair is just like a dog running after his tail. Can't get anywhere. What was the difference? What's the Quranic view on this? So, over here, I want to make certain things clear. Number one, <clears throat> the law, the natural law within. Kant says, and the Quran agrees with this, that the only proof for the existence of God are two. The starry skies above and the moral law within. A man is born with a certain disposition, which I'm going to go into a little bit more, a little bit later. But a man is born with a certain disposition of knowing what is right, what is wrong. A man was born with a disposition of knowing, like for example, murder is bad, lying is bad. The first time you lie, you feel really bad. You can put a person, on a human being, on a lie detector and the body is reacting to the fact that the person is lying, generally speaking. So, um, there is an internal knowledge of right and wrong. And this is what the Quran is saying. Quran is saying man is born with this knowledge of right and wrong. Man is born with this knowledge of the existence of God. Man is born with certain qualities that take him on a journey towards God, on the journey towards the divine. And so the Quran uses this point that there is a moral law within. You have the knowledge of right and wrong. After all, if there is no right and no wrong, then there is no judgment. And if there is no judgment, then Allah. So there is a judgment within you of right and wrong within you. Sometimes a person falls into a crisis because of this. And so there is a moral law within you. Why does it is, exist? And where does it take you? What journey does it take you on? Right? Every culture, every civilization, every human culture has sought the divine, sought the unseen. Why does human being go on this journey? On a purely rational basis, on a purely logical basis, there's no reason for human beings to go after something that is unseen because it is unseen. Why would we go after something like that? But there is something within the human instinct that drives human being in that direction. <clears throat> and this is what the Quran calls the human fitrah, the human nature. That the human nature is such that it wants to look for the divine. It has been imbued with qualities that force it look to look for the divine. And if man is not in touch with this human nature, if this nature, this natural programming that we're born with has been somehow corrupted, then you will not see order in the universe. You'll see disorder in the universe. You'll see what you want to see. And so, you know, the relationship between the heart and the mind is the very same as the relationship between the sun and the moon. The sun reflects its light on the moon. And the moon reflects it, the light it receives from the sun. In the same way, the sun is like the heart. Whatever is in your heart is reflected on your brain, and your brain then reflects that out into the outer world. If you see, if, you, if your heart is pure and sincere, for example, this happens many times, people that are, that are sincere are trustworthy. They assume because their heart is pure and it reflects upon their brain, and they assume, well, I'm trustworthy, so everyone else is trustworthy. And they trust people, even people that they shouldn't trust sometimes. 
because they're good people. And sometimes when a person is corrupt, when a person is corrupt, his heart is corrupt, he knows he's corrupt, he knows he's been deceiving people, and then when that light of his heart reflects on his brain and he looks at the outer world, he assumes everyone else is being just as corrupt as him. You see? And so the heart and the mind or the brain have this like uh, same relationship that the sun and the moon have. And so the human being is born with a certain disposition, a certain knowledge of right and wrong, a certain sense of justice, for example, a certain sense of shame when you do something wrong, a certain sense of shukr, gratitude, which I'm going to talk about how it relates to this, because according to the Quran, that is a very key factor. Are you on fitrah? If you are in fitra, the way to be on fitra is to have shukr. Because, after all, you have to thank something that exists. How else will you be thankful? When you're thankful, you're positive. You see your blessings. But if you're ungrateful and selfish, then you fall into a state of kufr. Imma shakira wa imma kafura. Will he be somebody who's thankful or somebody who covers the truth, who's just ungrateful and doesn't see the blessings around oneself? So let's go back to the topic I was talking about. So we believe in the unseen or the human beings tend to believe in the unseen. In fact, over here I'll mention very quickly uh, that children are born with the knowledge of the unseen. They believe in ghosts. They believe in the unseen. They believe that something, you know, that there's a cookie monster in the closet. C kids be are, are like, are uh, imbued or innately believe in the unseen things. And this has uh, been written about, documented, researched, and, and well uh, discussed in the academic world. That it's almost we're, we're born to believe. In fact, I think there's a book by that very name. So there's a knowledge of the law within that to murder is wrong. There's right and there's wrong. And so with intellect alone, you cannot prove God. You must have something of your fitra, of human nature. Okay, so you must have a sense of justice, for example. If there is a sense of justice, then a person knows that that there's something wrong and there's something right. And if you don't have a sense of justice, then you're far away from human disposition. And there are people in this world who don't have a sense of justice. Their, their programming internally has been corrupted. They don't feel bad that something bad is happening to poor people, for example. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ why don't you feed the poor people out of what Allah has given you? The people who deny the truth say to the believers, should we feed those people who Allah didn't decide to feed? No sense of justice. There's no sense of justice in a person who presses buttons and decides to kill people because it is of their own self-interest. And this exactly self-interest is the essence of kufr. Me. And I, in denial of any blessings or anything that you owe to anyone other than yourself. It, this is why the word kufr also means to be ungrateful. Like I said, I'm going to talk about shukr in a little bit. But only, and this is what I wanted to make clear today, and this is really the essence of today's conversation, that aql plus fitrah, that you have intellect, but with intellect, you have, you have the right disposition. So that you can put your aql, because the fitrah has to do with the heart. And aql has to do with the mind. If the fitrah is corrupted, then what you, then the ungratefulness, or the, the selfishness, or the self-interest, right? Or <clears throat> whatever corrupt, corruption that's occurred in the heart, then is only reflected in the thinking of the brain because the, the brain thinks in the direction of where the heart takes it. So if you 
if your heart is grateful, your mind will see things to be grateful about. If your heart is ungrateful, your mind will not see things to be grateful about. And then you'll say, well, you know, why should I believe in Allah? Why should I believe in God? He hasn't done anything for me. He never gave me anything I wanted. And so the relationship between aql, intelligence, and your fitrah, your, your, your human disposition, it is only when these come in sync, when these are two in sync with one another, that do you are you able to see very clearly without any doubt that Allah exists. It's only with that, when these two are in sync, can you penetrate into the unseen. It is only when the mind, your intelligence is being used by the light that is in the human fitrah, by the light that is in the human heart, that when this reflects on the brain and the brain thinks accordingly, that the, the person who looks at the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he looks at the inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard, indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth, wa ikhtilaf al layli wal nahar, and in the alteration of the day and the night, is he able to see, oh, there's a blue sky, wow. You know, it took a lot of money to figure out blue screens, like on the computer, are best for the eyes. It is only with that, when you are thinking from a certain perspective, with a certain fitrah, with a certain disposition, that when you are thinking and looking at the signs of Allah, the universe of Allah, that you begin to realize, okay, Allah exists. It is only when you accept that there is a moral law within. You're not being good for just the politics of it to look good but you're being good because it's actually the good thing to do to be good that there is an entity an idea that actually exists that goodness actually exists you know the idea that there is right and wrong that there is justice that that gratitude actually is something part of human being that the human being wants to feel gratitude that shame, فَإِن لَمْ if al شِعْتَ If you have no shame, do whatever you want. Every Prophet used to say this statement. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, if you have no shame, if you have no modesty, then do what you want. Why does human beings wear clothes? Why not just be without clothes like animals? This is the logic that some people use. This is what the nudist colonies this is what they say why don't you know why are we programmed you know culture has programmed us to wear clothes but rather i say no culture is a reflection of human nature and so therefore it's not that the culture is trying to dominate itself but that the man is reflecting the what is innate every human being respects knowledge for example every culture has respected knowledge and wisdom why because it's part of human nature. It is only when you are in touch with knowledge and with wisdom and with gratitude and with a sense of shame and with the sense of modesty that you have these internal qualities internally <coughs> and externally. You're able to see the signs of Allah in His creation. That can you only then penetrate into the unseen and does this the then only then does the idea of God make sense. In the times before the industrial age, the existence of God was never in question. It was who was who is the real God? Allah was known because people were much more in touch with nature. People were much more in touch with themselves. People were much more in a state of gratitude than today. People were in much more in a sense of modesty than today. And so they were able to penetrate into the unseen. They were able to have a journey and a quest towards the unseen, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنِّي ذَاهِبٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي سَيَحْدِينَ فَفِرُوا إِلَىٰ اللَّهِ Human beings, when it comes from a purely logical perspective, give bad reasons to prove God of what is instinctively there. And what is instinctively there is hard to prove what your instincts are telling you. And your instincts are telling you, oh, there is Allah. 
look at this sign. Look at this sign. But if you're looking at it without fitrah, without the proper human disposition, without a pure heart, if you're looking at the universe, then you will not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these, this word that the Quran uses, sign, right? The signs. What is it? A sign of what? Sign for what? What is the purpose of the sign? The purpose of the sign is to remind you of something that you forgot. Just like a friend, if he gave you a pen, and then you, over the years, lost the pen. And one day you find the pen, oh, and it reminds you of that friend when you found that pen. Oh, I had that friend. The purpose of being in nature, to live in nature, to be in nature, to be in a state of natural fitrah, is that one day something will happen and it will easily click, just so naturally click. Allah exists. So the, the, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they were already in a state of nature. Unlike that professor sitting in the couch, who's living in a completely artificial world, a virtual world. He, these companions, the Prophet, were already living in nature. They just needed to be reminded to see that perspective. See, all this is created by Allah. This is this all can't be just one big mistake. But to see that, you have to have a certain type of heart. And so, the pure reason will not see Allah. Just if you take away the human nature, away from man, if you were able to extract human nature, and just leave this body and intellect, you, you wouldn't even search for God. There's no need for you to. Only when you put this fitrah, this sense of right and wrong, the sense of justice, the sense of gratitude, the sense of shame and modesty, only when that comes in the heart does man begin to think, okay, wait. Only when you look at it from that perspective will you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you look at that the external through the internal perspective with that light. And so, <clears throat> now... The second thing I wanted to mention is you remember the journey the Prophet ﷺ had to what to, to the to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that most spiritual journey, Mi'araj. The Prophet was given a choice between milk and vi milk and wine. And the Prophet chose the milk. Why? Because it is the fitrah, as you may remember, the narration. It is the thing that is natural. Right? The Prophet chose the natural thing, the thing that is fitrah. That is according to human nature, right? You're born and you drink milk. First thing, milk is something that has to do with human nature. And it is part of nature. And milk is that part of nature that takes you towards nature. And so, there, there's a lot more on the issue of milk. But I'm just simply saying here that things that are artificial even if it is something like wine, which is made by human beings, it's part of the natural world because nothing that man makes is outside the natural world itself, but something that nature gives you itself, something that nature makes for you, that you prefer that which nature gives you over that which you may even make yourself. And so there is this instinctive knowledge for example rotten meat you know people get grossed out or just a better example is the idea of purification to be clean right we don't want uh things like feces on ourselves no we want to remove that from ourselves why do we clean ourselves why do we like good smells why do we remove bad smells right Th there's a certain knowledge there if you look at it from a purely intellectual perspective without the human fitra, for example, the issue of smell. If you say there's such a... You, you would then argue there's no such thing as bad or good smell. Because it's just a smell. Why define it as good and bad? But we say something is a good smell. Something is a bad smell. Why? Because we're programmed to think in that way. Otherwise... 
you know, and and from a purely intellect, only if you take out the fitra and just think of it from a purely logical perspective, just bad smell may not smell good to somebody, but it's not bad. It is only with human fitra that that bad smell becomes bad because you haven't taken a shower for a week, because you don't do istanja after using the bathroom, because you don't clean yourself up properly. Why do we want to clean ourselves up properly after using the bathroom? Why do we want to clothe ourselves? Right? This is, logically, you can say, well, there's no need to clothe yourself. Only from a perspective of aql itself. You can say, I don't need to clean myself after using the bathroom. From a purely aql perspective. But the human nature, the human fitra says otherwise. And so, there's some examples I'm trying to show you the effect of human nature. So, you, for example, why is ma man drawn to nature? Why live the sunnah lifestyle of the Prophet ﷺ? I'm doing this way. Right, doing wudu, being in marriage, for example. Now, you can argue, as modern society has, that marriage is a liability. Why be in marriage? Live outside marriage. Be with as many uh, partners as you want. But the fitra is, the human nature is that, what? Two people love each other, they live together, they be together, they help one another, they are companions for one another. This is human nature. But if you're out thinking outside human nature, then you'll be like, okay, why do I need to live that type of lifestyle of marriage? And so I'm trying to impress upon you the effect and the influence that our nature has upon us and our thinking and the way we think and how we would think if we didn't have this nature. And that how that relates to the modern times we live in. So nature and morals are interwoven according to the Qur'an, right? So for example, the Qur'an uses the metaphor of the day and the night. That after every night there's a day, right? The Qur'an uses this metaphor of, of, of darkness and a metaphor of light. But we see this not only in the moral sense, but we also see this in the physical world telling us about this story right that the rain falls and the and the and the crops grow another metaphor the quran uses over and over again but there's a lot of moral lessons in this because when the rain falls it's pure water it's pure and from that pure water comes these uh vegetables and and crops that we can eat from and so the quran is over and over again relating the relationship between what? Between the nature, water itself, right? Water is a purifying element or it has a purifying, pure, water is, you know, purifying and pure, it's pure and it's purifying. And the Quran uses that as a metaphor. Quran uses light as a metaphor. So, now, <clears throat> Let me talk about three aspects before I come to shukr, gratitude. What does the Quran say? And how does it relate to human fitrah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Luqman, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ We gave Luqman alayhi salatu wa salam hikmah. So he'll thank Allah. We gave him wisdom. Because when your aql and your fitrah come in sync and you think from that perspective, that is hikmah, that is wisdom. Hikmah literally means when you put things together in a in a strong way. So when your thinking is strong and your fitra, your human nature is strong, you're sensitive to the things in your heart, you're sensitive to the, to the disposition of being a human being. When you're sensitive to that and they come together, that gives you wisdom. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُكْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُ لِلَّهِ Indeed, we gave Luqman hikmah, so he will thank Allah. Because the issue, why does human beings want to show gratitude? Why do human beings want to show uh, appreciation and to thank people? You know, an atheist once said the worst part of being an atheist is you can't, there's no one to thank. There's, how an atheist, there's no one to thank. And the Quran is saying, 
No, you have to think. You thank your parents and you think and you think and you realize, Imam Ghazali talks about this, that the ultimate, you know, you realize as you grow up, what you have to, you're, you're thankful as the litmus test of human nature is your shukr. When someone does something good for you, do you feel indebted to them? You know, if someone did something good for you, do you feel indebted to them? Then do dua for them. And so, now, when this shukr, right, someone has done something good for you, feel indebted you to them. This is part of human nature. And ultimately, this takes you what? You thank your parents, you thank your relatives, you thank your society for doing good things to you, right? And then, ultimately, it takes you on a journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is human disposition. Shukr. Lawam. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة. Allah says, "I swear there will be a day of judgment. I swear by yourself that pricks you when you do something wrong." Al ithmu mahaka nafsak. The Prophet said, "A sin is that which pricks you when you do something wrong." وقرحت أن يطلع عليه الناس and you dislike that other people would come to know about your sins. That's human nature. What this idea that I don't want other people to know about the bad things I did. Otherwise, logically. You would say, who cares? Logically, if I did something wrong, I shouldn't even feel, I, logically I should tell myself, I shouldn't even feel that I did something wrong. That's just, a, that's just a social convention. But no, we feel we did something wrong when we do something wrong because it is part of human disposition. And human beings want to throw this programming out of themselves. So I don't feel any guilt. That's what the modern day psychology is all about. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Guilt is a bad thing. You should always be in a state of happiness and pleasure. The pleasure principle. So, the <clears throat> shukr, haya, shame, right? So, the question is, are we affected by being away from nature? Are we affected by being in a culture of more for me? Are we affected by being in a culture don't feel shame or guilty? What is my end lesson here? Aql plus fitra plus human nature. Just like that lost pen of your friend. Okay, when you found it, reminded you of your friend. Aql plus fitra equal ma'arifa of Allah is the knowing of Allah, the gnosis of God. The gnosis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pure intelligence won't do it. And this is why the Quran is very aware of this. And this is why the Quran uses very specific terminologies, two of which I shared with you today, like ghayb, the unseen. Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb, those who believe in the unseen. You can know the unseen or you can connect the dots to what you don't know if you have the correct perspective. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ And the other is ayah. There's a sign. The sign will point you in the right direction if you have the nur in your heart, if you have the light in your heart. Otherwise, you won't see it. You'll look at the sun and the moon and the cosmos and all the signs of the world and you will what? Not see God. Not see God. Because you don't have that perspective. So the Quranic perspective is, is that who are the people who respond to the call of the Quran? The people who respond to the call of the Quran are the people on fitrah. They already have good nature. They already have a strong sense of right and wrong. This is why the Quran mentions doing good to the parents. And if they call you towards shirk, don't follow them. Because the companions of the Prophet, obviously their parents were mushriks. In the beginning, they were mushriks. And people that are in good fitra feel gratitude towards their parents. It's very hard for them to go against their parents. Otherwise, from a logical perspective, it shouldn't be hard to go against your parents. Just on a purely logical perspective. It is only when the human disposition is brought into the picture that going against your parents becomes very difficult. But nowadays, people go against their parents. Why? Because they're not on human disposition. That the mother will give birth to her slave. And then now children treat their parents like slaves. Why? Because they're not on fitrah. They're not on good fitrah. 
they're not on good human disposition. They don't have that sense of shukr. They're in a state or in a culture of more me all the time. A sense of entitlement all the time. You know, it's a culture of immodesty. No shame. A, sen a culture of don't feel guilty for whatever you do. And so with a culture like that, yeah, you're going to look at things from the perspective of of, tr of not having shukr. And that will not lead you towards God. Not lead you towards God at all. And so the relationship between fitrah plus aql equal ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must have a clean heart, a pure heart, a sunnah lifestyle. Only with that type of heart and then using your brain accordingly. When the brain will reflect that calculation that is in your heart. Like the relationship I told you between the sun and the moon. Only then will you see, oh, will it only then become obvious and clear and manifest and like a burhan and mubin, absolutely self-evident, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. And anything other than that, to say Allah doesn't exist, is completely a miraj of being, it's like being away from yourself. It's like being away from your own disposition. It's like denying yourself disposition. It's like somebody saying, yes, I was born a male and I have male chromosomes, but I feel like I'm a female, right? That type of mental derangement, that type of mental mirage is like that same person who says there's no God because he can't see he's in this state of delusion where he's not in touch with his own self. Had a person, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَنُرِهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ We'll show you our signs in the horizons, meaning the external world, and in yourselves. But if you're not in a state of shukr, if you're in a state of kufr, which means being ungra ungrateful, having a sense of entitlement all the time, right? You're just going to be away from your disposition. And the result of that is, what we have today, unmotivated young men and women, Muslim sisters, on the edge, always in a state of anxiety because not being content, not in a state of shukr, not in a state of realizing what is, I mean, not re realizing that they need to go back to those qualities that will help them see the truth. So anyway, I end with this. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.